Hi, my sweet friends, and welcome back to Crochet Every Day with Judy. We're reading from Oliver Twist again, starting with chapter 49. Monks and Mr. Brownlow at length meet, their conversation and the intelligence that interrupts it. The twilight was beginning to close in when Mr. Brownlow alighted from a hackney coach at his own door and knocked softly. The door being opened, a sturdy man got out of the coach and stationed himself on one side of the steps, while another man, who had been seated on the box, dismounted too and stood upon the other side. At a sign from Mr. Brownlow, they helped out a third man, and taking him between them, hurried him into the house. This man was Monks. They walked in the same manner up the stairs without speaking, and Mr. Brownlow, preceding them, led the way into a back room. At the door of this apartment, Monks, who had ascended with evident reluctance, stopped. The two men looked to the old gentleman as if for instructions. He knows the alternative, said Mr. Brownlow. If he hesitates, removes a finger, but as you bid him, drag him into the street, call for the aid of the police, and impeach him as a felon in my name. How dare you say this of me, asked Monks. How dare you urge it, me to it, young man, replied Mr. Brownlow, confronting him with a steady look. Are you mad enough to leave this house? Unhand him. There, sir. You are free to go and we to follow. But I warn you by all I hold most solemn and most sacred, that the instant you set foot in the street, that instant will I have you apprehended on a charge of fraud and robbery. I am resolute and immovable. If you are determined to be the same, your blood be upon your own head. By what authority am I kidnapped in the street and brought here by these dogs? Asked Monks, looking from one to the other of the men who stood beside him. By mine, replied Mr. Brownlow. Those persons are indemnified by me. If you complain of being deprived of your liberty... You had power and opportunity to retrieve it as you came along, but you deemed it advisable to remain quiet. I say again, throw yourself for protection on the law. I will ap appeal to the law too, but when you have gone too far to recede, do not sue to me for leniency when the power will have passed into other hands, and do not say I plunged you down the gulf into which you rushed yourself. Monks was plainly disconcerted and alarmed besides. He hesitated. You will decide quickly, said Mr. Brownlow, with perfect firmness and composure. If you wish me to prefer my charges publicly and consign you to a punishment the extent of which, although I can with a shudder foresee, I cannot control. Once more I say, I say, you know the way. If not, and you appeal to my forbearance and the mercy of those you have deeply injured, seat yourself without a word in that chair. It has waited for you two whole days." Monks muttered some unintelligible words, but wavered still. You will be prompt, said Mr. Brownlow. A word from me, and the alternative is gone forever. Still the man hesitated. I have not the inclination to parley, said Mr. Brownlow, and as I advocate the dearest interests of others, I have not the right. Is there, demanded Monks with a faltering tongue, is there no middle course? None. Monks looked at the old gentleman with an anxious eye, but reading in his countenance nothing but severity and determination, walked into the room and, shrugging his shoulders, sat down. Lock the door on the outside, said Mr. Brownlow to the attendants, and come when I ring. The men obeyed, and the two were left alone together. This is pretty treatment, sir, said Monks, throwing down his hat and cloak, from my father's oldest friend. It is because I was your father's oldest friend, young man, returned Mr. Brownlow. It is because the hopes and wishes of young and happy years were bound up with him, and that fair creature of his blood and kindred who rejoined her God in youth, and left me here a solitary, lonely man. It is because he knelt with me beside his only sister's deathbed when he was yet a boy on the morning that would, but heaven willed otherwise, have made her my young wife. It is because my seared heart clung to him, from that time forth through all his trials and errors till he died. It is because old recollections and associations fill my heart, and even the sight of you brings with it old thoughts of him. It is because of all these things that I am moved to treat you gently now. Yes, Edward Lee Ford, even now, and blush for your unworthiness who bear the name. What is the name to do with it? asked the other, after contemplating, half in silence and half in dogged wonder, the agitation of his companion. What is the name to me? Nothing, replied Mr. Brownlow, nothing to you. But it was hers, and even at this distance of time brings back to me an old man, the glow and thrill which I once felt only to hear it repeated by a stranger. I am very glad you have changed it, very, very. This is almighty fine, said Monks, to retain his assumed designation. After a long silence, which during which he had jerked himself in sullen defiance to and fro, and Mr. Brownlow had sat shading his face with his hand. But what do you want with me? You have a brother, said Mr. Brownlow, rousing himself. A brother, the whisper of whose name in your ear when I came behind you in the street was in itself almost enough to make you accompany me hither in wonder and alarm. 
I have no brother, replied Monks. You know I was an only child. Why do you talk to me of brothers? You know that as well as I. Attend to what I do know, and you may not, said Mr. Brownlow. I shall interest you by and by. I know that of the wretched marriage into which family pride and the most sordid and narrowest of all ambition forced your unhappy father when a mere boy, you were the sole and most unnatural issue. I don't care for hard names, interrupted Monks with a jeering laugh. You know the fact, and that's enough for me. But I also know, pursued the old gentleman, the misery, the slow torture, the protracted anguish of that ill-assorted union. I know how listlessly and wearily each of that wretched pair dragged on their heavy chain through a world that was poison to them both. I know how cold formalities were succeeded by open taunts, how indifference gave place to dislike, dislike to hate, and hate to loathing, until at last they wrenched the clanking bond asunder, and retiring a wide space apart, carried each a galling fragment of which nothing but death could break the rivets to hide it in new society beneath the gayest looks they could assume. Your mother succeeded. She forgot it soon, but it rusted and cankered at your father's heart for years. Well, they were separated, said Monks, and what of that? When they had been separated for some time, returned Mr. Brownlow, and your mother, wholly given up to continental frivolities, had utterly forgotten the young husband, ten good years her junior, who with prospects blighted lingered on at home, he fell among new friends. This circumstance, at least, you know already. Not I, said Monks, turning away his eyes and beating his foot upon the ground as a man who is determined to, de to deny everything. Not I. Your manner, no less than your actions, assures me that you have never forgotten it or ceased to think of it with bitterness, returned Mr. Brownlow. I speak of fifteen years ago when you were not more than eleven years old and your father but one and thirty, for he was, I repeat, a boy when his father ordered him to marry. Must I go back to events which cast a shade upon the memory of your parent, or will you spare it and disclose to me the truth? I have nothing to disclose, rejoined Monks. You must talk on, as if you will." These new friends, then, said Mr. Brownlow, were a naval officer retired from active service whose wife had died some half a year before and left him with two children. There had been more, but all of their, but of all their family, happily, but two survived. They were both daughters, one a beautiful creature of nineteen, and the other a mere child of two or three years old. What's this to me? asked Monks. They resided, said Mr. Brownlow, without seeming to hear the interruption, in part of the country to which your father and his wandering had repaired, and where he had taken up his abode. Acquaintance, intimacy, friendship, fast followed on each other. Your father was as gifted, was gifted as few men are. He had his sister's soul and person. As the old officer knew him more and more, he grew to love him. I would that it had ended there. His daughter did the same. The old gentleman paused. Monks was biting his lips with his eyes fixed upon the floor. Seeing this, he immediately resumed. The end of a year found him contracted, solemnly contracted, to that daughter, the object of the first true, ardent, only passion of a guileless, untried girl. Your tale is of the longest, observed Monks, moving restlessly in his chair. It is a true tale of grief and trial and sorrow, young man, returned Mr. Brownlow, and such tales usually are. If it were one of unmixed joy and happiness, it would be very brief. At length, one of those rich relations, to strengthen whose interest and importance your father had been sacrificed, as others often are, it is no uncommon case, died, and to repair the misery he had been instrumental in occasioning, left him his pan panacea for all griefs, money. It was necessary that he should immediately repair to Rome, whither this man had sped for health, and where he had died, leaving his affairs in great confusion. He went, was seized with mortal illness there, was followed the moment the intelligence reached Paris by your mother, who carried you with her. He died the day after her arrival, leaving no will, no will, so that the whole property fell to her and you. At this part of the recital, Monks held his breath and listened with a face of e intense eagerness. Those eyes were not directed toward the speaker. As Mr. Brownlow paused, he changed his position with the air of one who has experienced a sudden relief and wiped his hot face and hands. Before he went abroad, and as he passed through London on his way, said Mr. Brownlow slowly and fixing his eyes upon the other's face, he came to me. <coughs> Excuse me. I never heard of that, interrupted Monks, in a tone intended to, to appear incredulous but savoring more of disagreeable surprise. He came to me and left with me, among some other things, a picture, a portrait painted by himself, a likeness of this poor girl, which he did not wish to leave behind and could not carry forward on his hasty journey. He was worn by anxiety and remorse almost to a shadow, talked in a wild, distracted way of ruin and dishonor worked by him. 
confided to me his intention to convert his whole property at any loss into money, and having settled on his wife and you a portion of his recent acquisition to fly the country, I guessed too well he would not fly alone, and never see it more, even from me, his old and early friend, whose strong attachment had taken root in the earth, root in the earth that covered one most dear to both, even from me he withheld, he withheld any more particular confession, promising to write and tell me all, and after that to see me once again for the last time on earth. Alas, that was the last time. I had no letter, and I never saw him more. I went, said Mr. Brownlow, after a short pause. I went when all was over to the scene of this. I will use the term the world would freely use, for worldly harshness or, or, or favor are now alike to him. Of his guilty love, resolved that if my fears were realized, that erring child should find one heart and home to shelter and compassionate her. The family had left that part a week before. They had called in such trifling debts as were outstanding, discharged them, and left the place by night. Why or whither, none can tell. Monks drew his breath yet more freely and looked round with a smile of triumph. When your brother, said Mr. Brownlow, drawing nearer to the other's chair, when your brother, a feeble, ragged, neglected child, was cast in my way by a stronger hand than chance and rescued by me from a life of vice and infamy. What? cried Monks. By me, said Mr. Brownlow. I told you I should interest you before long. I say by me. I see that your cunning associate suppressed my name, although, for aught he knew, it would be quite strange to your ears. When he was rescued by me then, and lay recovering from sickness in my house, his strong resemblance to this picture I have spoken of struck me with astonishment. Even when I first saw him in all his dirt and misery, there was a lingering expression in his face that came upon me like a glimpse of some old friend flashing on one in a vivid dream. I need not tell you he was snared away before I knew his history. Why not? asked Monks hastily because you know it well. I? Denial to me is vain, replied Mr. Brownlow. I shall show you that I know more than that. You, you can't prove anything against me, stammered Monks. I defy you to do it. We shall see, returned the old gentleman with a searching glance. I lost the boy and no efforts of mine could recover him. Your mother being dead, I knew that you alone could solve the mystery if anybody could, and as when I had last heard of you, you were on your own estate in the West Indies, whither, as you well know, you retired upon your mother's desk to escape the consequences of vicious courses here, I made the voyage. You had left it months before and were supposed to be in London, but no one could tell where. I returned. Your agents had no clue to your residence. You came and went, they said, as strangely as you had ever done sometimes for days together and sometimes not for months, keeping to all appearance the same low haunts and mingling with the same infamous herd who had been your associates when a fierce, ungovernable boy. I wearied them with new applications. I paced the streets by night and day, but until two hours ago all my efforts were fruitless and I never saw you for an instant. And now you do see me, said Monks, rising boldly. What then? Fraud and robbery are high-sounding words, justified, you think, by a fancied resemblance in some, some young imp to an idle daub of a dead man's. Brother, you don't even know that a child was born of this maudlin pair. You don't even know that. I did not, replied Mr. Brownlow, rising too, but within the last fortnight I have learnt it all. You have a brother, you know it, and him. There was a will which your mother destroyed, leaving the secret and the gain to you at her own death. It contained a reference to some child likely to be the result of this sad connection, which child was born and accidentally encountered by you when your suspicions were first awakened by his resemblance to his father. You repaired to the place of his birth. There existed proofs, proofs long suppressed of his birth and parentage. Those proofs were destroyed by you, and now, in your own words to your accomplice, the Jew, the only proofs of the boy's identity lie at the bottom of the river, and the old hag that received them from the mother is rotting in her coffin. Unworthy son, coward, liar, you who hold your counsels with thieves and murderers in dark rooms at night, you whose plots and wiles have brought a violent death upon the head of one worth millions such as you, you who from your cradle were gall and bitterness to your own father's heart, and in whom all evil passions, vice, and profligate profligacy festered till they found a vent in a hideous disease which has made your face an index even to your mind. You, Edward Leeford, do you still brave me? No, 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 returned the coward, overwhelmed by these accumulated charges. Every word, cried the old gentleman, every word that has passed between you and this detested villain is known to me. Shadows on the, will, on the wall have caught your whispers and brought them to my ear. The sight of the persecuted child has turned vice itself and given it the courage and almost the attri attributes of virtue. Murder has been done to which you were morally, if not really, a party.' 
No, no, interposed Monks. I, I know nothing of that. I was going to inquire the truth of the story when you overtook me. I didn't know the cause. I thought it was a common quarrel. It was the partial disclosure of your secrets, replied Mr. Brownlow. Will you disclose the whole? Yes, I will. Set your hand to a statement of truth and facts and repeat it before witnesses? That I promise too. Remain quietly here until such a document is drawn up and proceed with me to such a place as I may deem most advisable for the purpose of attesting it. If you insist upon that, I'll do that also, replied Monks. You must do more than that, said Mr. Brownlow. Make restitution to an innocent and un unoffending child, for such he is, although the offspring of a guilty and most miserable love. You have not forgotten the provisions of the will. Carry them into execution so far as your brother is concerned, and then go where, where you please. In this world, you need n meet no more. While Monks was pacing up and down, meditating with dark and evil looks on this proposal and the possibilities of evading it, torn by his fears on the one hand and his hatred on the other, the door was hurriedly unlocked and a gentleman, Mr. Losburn, entered the room in violent agitation. The man will be taken, he cried. He will be taken tonight. The murderer, asked Mr. Brownlow. Yes, yes, replied the other. His dog has been seen lurking about some old haunt, and there seems little doubt that his master either is or will be there under cover of the darkness. Spies are hovering about in every direction. I have spoken to the men who are charged with his capture, and they tell me he can never escape. A reward of a hundred pounds is proclaimed by government tonight. I will give fifty more, said Mr. Brownlow, and proclaim it with my own lips upon the spot if I can reach it. Where is Mr. Maley? Harry, as soon as he had seen your friend here safe in a coach with you, he hurried off to where he heard this, replied the doctor, and mounting his horse, sallied forth to join the first party at some place in the outskirts agreed upon between them. The Jew, said Mr. Brownlow, what of him? When I last heard, he had not been taken, but he will be, or is by this time, they're sure of him. Have you made up your mind? asked Mr. Brownlow in a low voice of monks. Yes, he replied. You, you will be secret with me? I will. Remain here until I return. It is your only hope of safety. They left the room and the door was locked again. What have you done? asked the doctor in a whisper. All that I could hope to do and even more, coupling the poor girl's intelligence with my previous knowledge and the result of our good, in good friend's inquiries on the spot, I left him no loophole of escape and laid bare the whole villainy by which these lights became plain as day. Write and appoint the evening after tomorrow at seven for the meeting. We shall be down there a few hours before, but shall require rest, especially the young lady who may have greater need of firmness than, I, than either you or I can quite foresee just now. But my blood boils to avenge this poor murdered creature. Which way have they taken? Drive straight to the office and you will be in time, replied Mr. Losburn. I will remain here. The two gentlemen hastily separated, each in a fever of excitement wholly uncontrollable. Controllable. Sorry. Chapter 50, The Pursuit and Escape. Now to the part of the Thames on which the church at Rotherhith abuts, where the buildings on the banks are dirtiest and the vessels on the river blackest with the dust of colliers and the smoke of close-built low-roofed houses, there exists at the present day the filthiest, the strangest, the most extraordinary of the many localities that are hidden in London, wholly unknown even by name to the great mass of its inhabitants. To reach this place, the visitor has to penetrate through a maze of close, narrow, and muddy streets, thronged by the roughest and poorest of waterside people and devoted to the traffic they may be supposed to occasion. The cheapest and least delicate provisions are heaped in the shops. The coarsest and commonest articles of wearing apparel dangle at the salesman's door and stream from the house parapet and windows. Jostling with unemployed laborers of the lowest class, ballast heavers, coal whippers, brazen women, ragged children, and the very raff and refuse of the river, he makes his way with difficulty along, assailed by offensive size, sights and smells from the narrow alleys which branch off on the right and left. And deafened by the clash of ponderous wagons that bear great piles of merchandise from the stacks of warehouses that rise from every corner. Arriving at length in streets remoter and less frequented than those through which he has passed, he walks beneath tottering house fronts projecting over the pavement, dismantled walls that seem to totter as he passes, chimneys half crushed, half hesitating to fall, windows guarded by rusty iron bars that time and dirt have almost eaten away, and every imaginable sign of desolation and neglect. In such a neighborhood, beyond Dockhead and the borough of Southwark, stands Jacob's Island, surrounded by a muddy ditch six or eight feet deep and fifteen or twenty wide when the tide is in, once called Mill Pond, but known in these days as Folly Ditch. It is a creek or inlet from the Thames and can always be filled at high water by opening the sluices at the lead mills from which it took its old name. 
At such times, a stranger looking from one of the wooden bridges thrown across it at Mill Lane will see the inhabitants, inhabitants of the houses on either side lowering from their back doors and windows buckets, pails, domestic utensils of all kinds in which to haul the water up. And when his eye is turned from these operations to the houses themselves, his utmost astonishment will be excited by the scene before him. Crazy wooden galleries common to the backs of half a dozen houses with holes from which to look upon the slime beneath, windows broken and patched with poles thrust out on which to dry the linen that is never there, rooms so small, so filthy, so confined that the air would seem too tainted even for the dirt and squalor which they shelter, wooden chambers thrust, thrusting themselves one above the mud and threatening to fall into it, as some have done, dirt besmeared walls and decaying foundations, every repulsive liniment or liniment of poverty, every loathsome indication of filth, rot, and garbage, all these ornament the banks of Folly Ditch. In Jacob's Island, the warehouses are roofless and empty. The walls are crumbling down. The windows are windows no more. The doors are falling into the streets. The chimneys are blackened, but they yield no smoke. Thirty or forty years ago, before losses and chancery suits came upon it, it was a thriving place, but now it is a desolate island indeed. The houses have no owners. They are broken open and entered upon by those who have the courage, and there they live and there they die. They must have powerful motives for a secret residence or be reduced to a destitute condition indeed who seek a refuge in Jacob's Island. In an upper room of one of these houses, a detached house of fair size, ruinous in other aspects, but strongly defended at door and window of which house the back commanded the ditch and manner already described, there were assembled three men who, regarding each other every now and then with looks express expressive of perplexity and expectation, sat for some time in profound and gloomy silence. One of these was Toby Crackett, another Mr. Chitling, and the third, a robber of fifty years whose nose had been almost beaten in, in some old scuffle, and whose face bore a frightful scar which might probably be traced to the same occasion. This man was a return transport, and his name was Cags. I wish, said Toby, returning to, Miss, turning to Mr. Chitling, that you had picked out some other crib when, when the two old ones got too warm and did not come here, my fine feller. Why didn't you, you blunderhead, said Cags. Well, I thought you'd have been a little more glad to see me than this, replied Mr. Chitling with a melancholy air. Why, look, young gentleman, said Toby, when a man keeps himself so very exclusive as I have done, and by that means has a snug house over his head with nobody prying or smelling about it, it's rather a startling thing to have the honor of a visit from a young gentleman, however respectable and pleasant a person he may be to play cards with at conveniency, circumstances you are. Especially when the exclusive young man has got a friend stopping with him that's arrived sooner than was expected from foreign parts and is too modest to want to be presented to the judges on his return, added Mr. Caggs. There was a short silence after which Toby Crackett, seeming to abandon as hopeless as any, any further effort to maintain his usual devil-may-care swagger, turned to Chitling and said, When was Fagin took then? Just at dinner time, two o'clock this afternoon, Charlie and I made our lucky up the wash's chimney and Bolter got into the empty water butt headed downwards, but his legs were so precious long that they stuck out at the top and so they took him too. And Bet, Poor Bet, she went to see the body to speak to who it was, replied Chitling, his countenance falling more and more, and went off mad, screaming and raving and beating her head against the boards, so they put a straight waistcoat on her and took her to the hospital. And there she is. "'What's become of young Bates?' demanded Cags. "'He hung about, not to come over here afore dark, "'but he'll be here soon,' replied Chitling. "'There's nowhere else to go to now, "'for the people at the Cripples are all in custody, "'and the bar of the Ken, I went up there "'and seen it with my own eyes, is filled with traps.' "'This is a smash,' observed, to observed Toby, biting his lips. "'There's more than one will go with us.' "'The sessions are on,' said Cags. "'If they get the inquest over and Bolter takes turns King's evidence, as of course he will from what he's said already. They can prove Fagin an accessory before the fact, and get the trial on on Friday, and he'll swing in six days from this, by God. You should have heard the people groan, said Chitling. The officers fought like devils, or they'd have torn him away. He was down once, but they made a ring around him and fought their way along. You should have seen how he looked about him, all muddy and bleeding, and clung to them as if they were his dearest friends. I can see him now, not able to stand upright with the pressing of the mob, and dragging him along amongst them. I can see the people jumping up one behind another and snarling with their teeth and making at him like wild beasts. I can see the blood upon his hair and beard and hear the cries with which the women worked themselves into the center of the crowd at the street corner and swore they'd tear his heart out. 
The horror-stricken witness of this scene pressed his hands upon his ears and, with his eyes closed, got up and paced violently to and fro like one distracted. Whilst he was thus engaged, and the two men sat, in, sat by in silence with their eyes fixed upon the floor, a pattering noise, noise was heard upon the stairs, and Sykes's dog bounded into the room. They ran to the window downstairs and into the street. The dog had jumped in at an open window. He made no attempt to follow them, nor was his master to be seen. "'What's the meaning of this?' said Toby, when they had returned. "'He can't be coming here. I—I I hope not. "'If he was coming here, he'd have come with the dog,' said Cags, "'stooping down to examine the animal who lay panting on the floor. "'Here, give us some water for him. He has run himself faint.' "'He's drunk it all up every drop,' said Chitling, "'after watching the dog some time in silence. "'Covered with mud, lame, half-blind, he must have come a long way.' "'Where can he have come from?' exclaimed Toby. "'He's been to the other cans, of course, "'and finding them filled with strangers, come on here, "'where he's been many a time and often.' But where can he have come from first, and how come he's, he's here alone without the other? He, none of them called the murderer by his old name. He can't have made away with himself. What do you think, asked, said Chitling. Toby shook his head. If he had, said Cags, the dog would want to lead us away to where he did it. No, I think he's got out of the country and left the dog behind. He must have given him the slip somehow, or he wouldn't be so easy. This solution appearing the most probable one was adopted as the right, and the dog, creeping under a chair, coiled himself up to sleep without more notice from anybody. It being now dark, the shutter was closed and a candle lighted and placed upon the table. The terrible events of the last two days had made a deep impression on all three, increased by the danger and uncertainty of their own position. They drew their chairs closer together, starting at every sound. They spoke little and that in whispers, and were as silent and awe-stricken as if the remains of the murdered woman lay in the next room. They had sat thus some time when suddenly was heard a hurried knocking at the door below. "'Young Bates,' said Cags, looking angrily round to check the fear he felt himself." The knocking came again. No, he wasn't. He, it wasn't he. He never knocked like that. Crackett went to the window and, shaking all over, drew in his head. There was no need to tell them who it was. His pace, pale face was enough. The dog, too, was on alert in an instant and ran whining to the door. We must let him in, he said, taking up the candle. Is there any help for it? asked the other man in a hoarse voice. None. He must come in. Don't leave us in the dark, said Cags, taking down a candle from the chimney piece and lighting it. And with such a trembling hand that he not, I'm sorry, with such a trembling hand that the knock was twice repeated before he had finished. Crackett went down to the door and returned, followed by a man with the lower part of his face buried in a handkerchief and another tied over his head under his hat. He drew them slowly off. Blanched face, sunken eyes, hollow cheeks, beard of three days growth, wasted flesh, short, thick breath. It was the very ghost of Sykes. He laid his hand upon a chair which stood in the middle of the room, but shuddering as he was about to drop into it and seeming to glance over his shoulder, dragged it back close to the wall, as close as it would go, ground it against it, and sat down. Not a word had been exchanged. He looked from one to another in silence. If an eye were furtively raised and met his, it was instantly averted. When his hollow voice broke silence, they all three started. They seemed never to have heard his tones before. How came that dog here, he asked. Alone, three hours ago. Tonight's paper says that Fagin's taken. Is it true or a lie? True. They were silent again. Damn you all, said Sykes, passing his hand across his forehead. Have you nothing to say to me? There was an uneasy movement among, among them, but nobody spoke. You that keep this house, said Sykes, turning his face to crack it. Do you mean to sell me or to let me lie here till this hunt is over? You may stop here if you think it's safe, returned the person addressed after some hesitation. Sykes carried his eyes slowly up the wall behind him, rather trying to turn his head than actually doing it, and said, Is it the body? Is it buried? They shook their heads. Why isn't it? He retorted with the same glance behind him. What do they keep such ugly things above the ground for? Who's that knocking? Crackett intimated by a motion of his hand as he left the room that there was nothing to fear, and directly came back with Charlie Bates behind him. Sykes sat opposite the door so that the moment the boy entered the room he encountered his figure. Toby, said the boy, falling back as Sykes turned his eyes toward him, why didn't you tell me this downstairs? There had been something so tremendous in the shrinking off of the three that the wretched man was willing to propitiate even this lad. Accordingly, he nodded and made as though he would shake hands with him. Let me go into some other room, said the boy, retreating still further. Charlie, said Sykes, stepping forward, don't you, don't you know me? Don't come nearer me, answered the boy, still retreating and looking with horror in his eyes upon the murderer's face. You monster! The man stopped halfway, and they looked at each other, but Sykes's eyes sunk gradually to the ground. "'Witness, you three, cried the boy, shaking his clenched, clenched fist and becoming more and more excited as he spoke. "'Witness, you three, I'm not afraid of him. If they come here after him, I'll give him up, I will.' 
I tell you out at once. He may kill me for it if he likes or if he dares, but if I'm here, I'll give him up. I'd give him up if he was to be boiled alive. Murder, help, if there's the pluck of a man among you three, you'll help me. Murder, help, down with him. Pouring out these cries and accompanying them with violent gesticulation, the boy actually threw himself single-handed upon the strong man and in the intensity of his energy and the suddenness of his surprise brought him heavily to the ground. The three spectators seemed quite stupefied. They offered no interference, and the boy and man rolled on the ground together. The former, heedless of the blows that showered upon him, wrenching his hands tighter and tighter in the garments about the murderer's breast, and never ceasing to call for help with all his might. The contest, however, was too unequal to last long. Sykes had him down, and his knee was on his throat when Crackett pulled him back with a look of alarm and pointed to the window. There were lights gleaming below, voices in loud and earnest conversation, the tramp of hurried footsteps, endless they seemed in number, crossing the street with the nearest wooden bridge. One man on horseback seemed to be among the crowd, for there was the no noise of hoofs rattling on the uneven pavement. The gleam of lights increased. The footsteps came more thickly and noisily on. Then came a loud knocking at the door, and then a hoarse murmur from such a multitude of angry voices as would have made the boldest quail. Help! shrieked the boy in a voice that rent the air. He's here! Break down the door! In the king's name! cried the voices without, and the hoarse cry rose again but louder. Break down the door! screamed the boy. I tell you they'll never open it. Run straight to the room where the light is. Break down the door! Strokes, thick and heavy, rattled upon the door and lower window shutters as he ceased to speak, and a loud huzzah burst from the crowd, giving the listener for the first time some adequate idea of its immense extent. "'Open the door of some place where I can lock this screeching hell, babe,' cried Sykes fiercely, running to and fro and dragging the boy now as easily as if he were an empty sack. "'That door, quick!' He flung him in, he flung him in bolted it, and turned the key." Is the downstairs door fast? Double locked and chained, replied Crackett, who with the other two men still remained quite helpless and bewildered. The panels, are they strong? Lined with sheet iron. And the windows too? Yes, and the windows. Damn you, cried the desperate ruffian, throwing up the sash and menacing the crowd. Do your worst, I'll cheat you yet. Of all the terrific yells that ever fell on mortal ears, none could exceed the cry of the infuriated throng. Some shouted to those who were nearest to set the house on fire. Others roared to the officers to shoot him dead. Among them all, none showed such fury as the man on horseback, who, throwing himself out of the saddle and bursting through the crowd as if he were parting water, cried beneath the window in a voice that rose above all others, Twenty guineas to the man who brings a ladder. The nearest voices took up the cry, and hundreds echoed it. Some called for ladders, some for sledgehammers, some ran with torches to, to and fro as if to seek them, and still came back and roared again. Some spent their breath in impotent curses and execrations. Some pressed forward with the ecstasy of madmen, and thus impeded the progress of those below. Some among the boldest attempted to climb up by the water spouting crevices in the wall, and all waved to and fro in the darkness beneath like a field of corn moved by an angry wind, and joined from time to time in one loud furious roar. The tide, cried the murderer, as he staggered back into the room and shut the faces out. The tide was in as I came up. Give me a rope, a long rope. They're all in front. I may drop into the folly ditch and clear off that way. Give me a rope, or I shall do three more murders and kill myself at last. The panic-stricken men pointed to where such articles were kept. The murderer, hastily selecting the longest and strongest cord, hurried up to the housetop. All the windows in the rear of the house had been long ago bricked up except one small trap in the room where the boy was locked, and that was too small even for the passage of his body. But from this aperture he had never ceased to call on those without to guard the back, and thus when the murderer emerged at last on the house top by the door in the roof, a loud shout proclaimed the fact to those in front who immediately began to pour round, pressing upon each other in one unbroken stream. He planted a board which he had carried up with him for the purpose— so firmly against the door that it must be a matter of great difficulty to open it from the inside, and creeping over the tiles, looked over the low parapet. The water was out in the ditch, a bed of mud. The crowd had been hushed during these few moments, watching his motions and doubtful of his purpose. But the instant they perceived it and knew it was defeated, they raised a cry of triumphant execration to which all their previous shouting had been whispers. Again and again it rose. Those who were at too great a distance to know its meaning took up the sound. It echoed and re-echoed. It seemed as though the whole city had poured its population out to curse him. On pressed the people from the front. On, 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 in a strong, struggling current of angry faces, with here and there a glaring torch to light them up and show them out in all their wrath and passion. The houses on the opposite side of the ditch had been entered by the mob. Sashes were thrown up or torn bodily out. There were tears and tears of faces in every window and cluster upon cluster of people clinging to every housetop. 
Each little bridge, and there were three in sight, bent beneath the weight of the crowd upon it. Still the current poured on to find some nook or hole from which to vent their shouts, and only for an instant to see the wretch. They have him now, cried a man on the nearest bridge. Hurrah! The crowd grew light with uncovered heads, and again the shout uprose. I promise fifty pounds, cried an old gentleman from the same quarter. Fifty pounds to the man who takes him alive. I will remain here till he comes to ask me for it. There was another roar. At this moment the word was passed among the crowd that the door was forced at last, and that he who had first called for the ladder had mounted into the room. The stream abruptly turned as this intelligence ran from mouth to mouth, and the people at the windows, seeing those upon the bridges pouring back, quitted their stations and running into the street, joined the concourse that now thronged pell-mell to the spot they had left, each man crushing and striving with his neighbor, and all panting with impatience to get near the door and look upon the criminal as the officers brought him out. The cries and shrieks of those who were pressed almost to suffocation or trampled down and trodden underfoot in the confusion were dreadful. The narrow ways were completely blocked up, and at this time, between the rush of some to regain the space in front of the house and the unveiling, unavailing struggles of others to extricate, extricate themselves from the mass, the immediate attention was distracted from the murderer, although the universal eagerness for his capture was, if possible, increased. The man had shrunk down, thoroughly quelled by the ferocity of the crowd and the impossibility of escape. But seeing the sudden change with no less rapidity than it had occurred, he sprung upon his feet, determined to make one last effort for his life by dropping into the ditch, and at the risk of being stifled, endeavoring to creep away in the darkness and confusion. Roused into new strength and energy and stimulated by the noise within the house, which announced that an entrance had really been effected, he set his foot against a stack of chimneys, fastened one end of the rope tightly and firmly around it, and with the other made a strong running noose by the aid of his hands and teeth almost in a second. He could let himself down by the cord to within a less, a less distance of the ground than his own height, and had his knife ready in his hand to cut it then and drop. At the very instant when he brought the the loop over his head previous to slipping it beneath his armpits, and when the old gentleman aforementioned, who had clung so tight to the railing of the bridge as to resist the force of the crowd and retain his position, earnestly warned those about him that the man was about to lower himself down, and at and that very instant the murderer, looking behind him on the roof, threw his arms above his head and uttered a yell of terror. The eyes again, he cried in an unearthly screech. Staggering, as if struck by lightning, he lost his balance and tumbled over the parapet. The noose was at his neck. It ran up with his weight, tight as a bowstring, and swift as the arrow at speeds. He fell for, high, for five and thirty feet. There was a sudden jerk, a terrific convulsion of the limbs, and there he hung, with the open knife clenched in his stiffening hand. The old chimney quivered with the shock, but stood it bravely. The murderer swung lifeless against the wall, and the boy, thrusting aside the dangling body which obscured his view, called to the people to come and take him out for God's sake. A dog which had lain concealed till now ran backwards and forwards on the parapet with a dismal howl, and collecting himself for a spring, jumped for the dead man's shoulders. Missing his aim, he fell into the ditch, turning completely over as he went, and striking his head against a stone, dashed out his brains. Sorry to have to stop there, but we stop there and start tomorrow with our next time with chapter 51. Thank you. Bye-bye.